Guys, welcome. Chapter 10 and 11 of Reminiscences of the Stock Operator. Some amazing lessons are described in these two chapters. How do million dollar traders learn from their losses? Very important concept explained that it's not the losses themselves, but it's not taking the losses that does the most damage to the trader's soul. An example of trading commodities versus trading stocks is given in chapter 10. You'll be able to learn the secret of trading in the line of list resistance, which is going to allow you to enter the trades timely when it really matters. How to trade the markets that are range bound. Oftentimes, different market environments require different strategy. Learn specifically how did Jesse Livermore traded the markets that were range bound some highly highly impactful psychology principles are shared in these two chapters and here's my favorite instead of hoping fear when you're losing and when winning instead of fearing hope and that is an amazing rule if you follow that guys your results are going to go through the roof in chapter 11 you will learn the correlation type trade that is explained in high detail what on earth do oats have to do with wheat and how can you utilize such a strategy in your daily trading also shares that best traders don't play prejudice but rather market conditions and some amazing examples are given in these chapters on how to properly accumulate and close out sizable short and long positions. Guys, if you're trying to learn more about trading stocks or options, simply click the links below this video, schedule your 20-minute trading coaching session, get all your questions answered so you can finish this year strong and make your next year your most profitable trading year ever guys enjoy these two chapters of the reminiscences of the stock operator the recognition of our own mistakes should not benefit us any more than the study of our successes but there's a natural tendency in all men to avoid punishment when you associate certain mistakes with a licking you do not hanker for a second dose and of course all stock market mistakes wound you in two tender spots your pocketbook and your vanity. But I will tell you something curious. A stock speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows that he is making them. And after he makes them, he will ask himself why he made them. And after thinking over it cold-bloodedly a long time after the pain of punishment is over, he may learn how he came to make them, and when, and at what particular point of his trade, but not why. And then he simply calls himself names and lets it go at that. Of course, if a man is both wise and lucky, he will not make the same mistake twice. But he will make any one of the 10,000 brothers or cousins of the original. The mistake family is so large, but there is always one of them around when you want to see what you can do in the fool play line. To tell you about the first of my million dollar mistakes, I shall have to go back to this time when I first became a millionaire, right after the big break of October 1907. As far as my trading went, having a million merely meant more reserves. Money does not give a trader more comfort, because rich or poor, he can make mistakes, and it is never comfortable to be wrong. And when a millionaire is right, his money is merely one of his several servants. Losing money is the least of my troubles. A loss never bothers me after I take it. I forget it overnight. But being wrong, not taking the loss, that is what does the damage to the pocketbook and to the soul. You remember Dixon G. Watt's story about the man who was so nervous that a friend asked him what was the matter? I can't sleep, answered the nervous one. Why not, asked the friend. I'm carrying so much cotton that I can't sleep thinking about it. It's wearing me out. What can I do? Sell down to the sleeping point, answered the friend. As a rule, a man adapts himself to conditions so quickly that he loses the perspective. He does not feel the difference much. That is, he does not vividly remember how it felt not to be a millionaire. He only remembers that there were things he could not do that he can do now. It does not take a reasonably young and normal man very long to lose the habit of being poor. It requires a little longer to forget that he used to be rich. I suppose that is because money creates needs or encourages their multiplication. I mean that after a man makes money in the stock market, he very quickly loses the habit of not spending. But after he loses his money, it takes him a long time to lose the habit of spending. 
After I took in my shorts and went long in October 1907, I decided to take it easy for a while. I bought a yacht and planned to go off on a cruise in southern waters. I'm crazy about fishing, and I was due to have the time of my life. I looked forward to it and expected to go any day, but I did not. The market wouldn't let me. I always have traded in commodities as well as in stocks. I began as a youngster in the bucket shops. I studied those markets for years, though perhaps not so assiduously as the stock market. As a matter of fact, I would rather play commodities than stocks. There's no question about their greater legitimacy, as it were. It partakes more of the nature of a commercial venture than trading in stocks does. A man can approach it as he might any mercantile problem. It may be possible to use fictitious arguments for or against a certain trend in a commodity market, but success will only be temporary, for in the end the facts are bound to prevail, so that a trader gets dividends on study and observation, as he does in a regular business. He can watch and weigh conditions, and he knows as much about it as anyone else. He need not guard against inside cliques. Dividends are not unexpectedly passed or increased overnight in the cotton market, or in wheat or corn. In the long run, commodity prices are governed but by one law, the economic law of demand and supply. The business of the trader in commodities is simply to get facts about the demand and the supply, present and prospective. He does not indulge in guesses about a dozen things, as he does in stocks. It always appealed to me trading in commodities. Of course, the same things happen in all speculative markets. The message of the tape is the same. That will be perfectly plain to anyone who will take the trouble to think. He will find, if he asks himself questions and considers conditions, that the answers will supply themselves directly. But people never take the trouble to ask questions, leave alone seeking answers. The average American is from Missouri, everywhere, and at all times, except when he goes to the broker's offices and looks at the tape, whether it is stocks or commodities. The one game of all games that really requires study before making a play is the one he goes into without his usual highly intelligent preliminary and precautionary doubts. He will risk half his fortune in the stock market with less reflection than he devotes to the selection of a medium-priced automobile. This matter of tape rating is not so complicated as it appears. Of course, you need experience. But it is even more important to keep certain fundamentals in mind. To read the tape is not to have your fortune told. The tape does not tell you how much you will surely be worth next Thursday at 1.35 p.m. The object of reading the tape is to ascertain first how, and next when to trade. That is, whether it is wiser to buy than to sell. It works exactly the same for stocks as for cotton or wheat or corn or oats. You watch the market, that is, the course of prices as recorded by the tape with one object, to determine the direction, that is, the price tendency. Prices we know will move either up or down according to the resistance they encounter. For purposes of easy explanation, we will say that prices, like everything else, move along the line of least resistance. They will do whatever comes easiest. Therefore, they will go up if there is less resistance to an advance than to a decline, and vice versa. Nobody should be puzzled as to whether a market is a bull or bear market after it fairly starts. The trend is evident to a man who has an open mind and reasonably clear sight, for it is never wise for a speculator to fit his facts to his theories. Such a man will, or ought to, know whether it is a bull or bear market. And if he knows that, he knows whether to buy or to sell. It is therefore at the very inception of the movement that a man needs to know whether to buy or to sell. Let us say, for example, that the market, as it usually does in those between swings times, fluctuates within a range of 10 points, up to 130 and down to 120. It may look very weak at the bottom, or on the way up after a rise of 8 or 10 points, it may look as strong as anything. A man ought not to be led into trading by tokens. He should wait until the tape tells him that the time is ripe. As a matter of fact, millions upon millions of dollars have been lost by men who bought stocks because they looked cheap, or sold them because they looked dear. The speculator is not an investor. His object is not to secure a steady return on his money at a good rate of interest, but to profit by either a rise or a fall in the price of whatever he may be speculating in. Therefore, the thing to determine is the speculative line of least resistance at the moment of trading, and what he should wait for is the moment when that line defines itself.
because that is his signal to get busy. Reading the tape merely enables him to see that at 1.30 the selling has been stronger than the buying, and a reaction in the price logically followed. Up to the point where the selling prevailed over the buying, superficial students of the tape may conclude that the price is not going to stop short of 150 and they buy. But after the reaction begins, they hold on or sell out at a small loss, or they go short and talk bearish. But at 120, there is stronger resistance to the decline. The buying prevails over the selling. There is a rally in the shorts cover. The public is so often whipsawed that one marvels at their persistence in not learning their lesson. Eventually, something happens that increases the power of either the upward or the downward force, and the point of greatest resistance moves up or down. That is, the buying at 130 will for the first time be stronger than the selling, or the selling at 120 be stronger than the buying. The price will break through the old barrier, or movement limit, and go on. As a rule, there is always a crowd of traders who are short at 120 because it looks so weak, or long at 130 because it looks so strong. And when the market goes against them, they are forced, after a while, either to change their minds and turn, or to close out. In either event, they help to define even more clearly the price line of least resistance. Thus, the intelligent trader who has patiently waited to determine this line will enlist the aid of fundamental trade conditions, and also of the force of the trading of that part of the community that happened to guess wrong, and must now rectify mistakes. Such corrections tend to push prices along the line of least resistance. And right here I will say that though I do not give it as a mathematical certainty or as an axiom of speculation, my experience has been that accidents, that is the unexpected or unforeseen, have always helped me in my market position whenever the latter has been based upon my determination of the line of least resistance. Do you remember that Union Pacific episode at Saratoga that I told you about? Well, I was long because I found out that the line of least resistance was upward. I should have stayed long, instead of letting my broker tell me that insiders were selling stocks. It didn't make any difference what was going on in the director's minds. That was something I couldn't possibly know. But I could and did know that the tape said, going up. And then came the unexpected rising of the dividend rate and the 30-point rise in the stock. At 164, prices looked mighty high. But as I told you before, stocks are never too high to buy or too low to sell. The price, per se, has nothing to do with establishing my line of least resistance. You will find in actual practice that if you trade as I have indicated, any important piece of news given out between the closing of one market and the opening of another is usually in harmony with the line of least resistance. The trend has been established before the news is published, and in bull markets, bear items are ignored, and bull news exaggerated, and vice versa. Before the war broke out, the market was in a very weak condition. There came the proclamation of Germany's submarine policy. I was short 150,000 shares of stock, not because I knew the news was coming, but because I was going along the line of least resistance. What happened came out of a clear sky, as far as my play was concerned. Of course, I took advantage of the situation, and I covered my shorts that day. It sounds very easy to say that all you have to do is watch the tape, establish your resistance points, and be ready to trade along the line of least resistance as soon as you've determined it. But in actual practice, a man has to guard against many things, and most of all, against himself. That is, against human nature. That is the reason why I say that the man who is right always has two forces working in his favor, basic conditions and the men who are wrong. In a bull market, bear factors are ignored. That is human nature. And yet, human beings profess astonishment at it. People will tell you that the wheat crop has gone to pot because there has been bad weather in one or two sections, and some farmers have been ruined. When the entire crop is gathered and all the farmers and all the wheat-growing sections begin to take their wheat to the elevators, the bulls are surprised at the smallness of the damage. They discover that they merely have helped the bears. When a man makes his play in a commodity market, he must not permit himself set opinions. He must have an open mind and flexibility. It is not wise to disregard the message of the tape, no matter what your opinion of crop conditions or of the probable demand may be. I recall how I missed a big play just by trying to anticipate the starting signal. I felt so sure of conditions that I thought it was not necessary to wait for the line of least resistance to define itself. 
I even thought I might help it arrive, because it looked as if it merely needed a little assistance. I was very bullish on cotton. It was hanging around 12 cents, running up and down within a moderate range. It was in one of those in-between places, and I could see it. I knew I really ought to wait, but I got to thinking that if I gave it a little push, it would go beyond the upper resistance point. I bought 50,000 bales. Sure enough, it moved up. And sure enough, as soon as I stopped buying it, it stopped going up. Then it began to settle back to where it was when I began buying it. I got out and it stopped going down. I thought I was now much near the starting signal. And presently I thought I'd start it myself again. I did. The same thing happened. I bid it up only to see it go down when I stopped. I did this four or five times until I finally quit in disgust. It cost me about $200,000. I was done with it. It wasn't very long after that when it began to go up and never stopped till it got to a price that would have meant a killing for me if I hadn't been in such a great hurry to start. This experience has been the experience of so many traders so many times that I can give this rule. In a narrow market when prices are not getting anywhere to speak of but move within a narrow range, there is no sense in trying to anticipate what the next big movement is going to be, up or down. The thing to do is to watch the market. Read the tape to determine the limits of the get-nowhere prices, and make up your mind that you will not take an interest until the price breaks through the limit in either direction. A speculator must concern himself with making money out of the market, and not with insisting that the tape must agree with him. Never argue with it or ask it for reasons or explanations. Stock market postmortems don't pay dividends. Not so long ago, I was with a party of friends. They got to talking wheat. Some of them were bullish and others bearish. Finally, they asked me what I thought. Well, I had been studying the market for some time. I knew they did not want any statistics or analyses of conditions. So I said, if you want to make some money out of wheat, I can tell you how to do it. They all said they did, and I told them, if you are sure you wish to make money in wheat, just you watch it. Wait, the moment it crosses $1.20, buy it, and you will get a nice quick play in it. Why not buy it at 114, one of the party asks. Because I don't know yet that it's going up at all. Then why buy it when it's at $1.20? It seems a mighty high price. Do you wish to gamble blindly in the hope of getting a great big profit? Or do you wish to speculate intelligently and get a smaller but much more probable profit? They all said they wanted the smaller but sure profit. So I said, then do as I tell you. If it crosses $1.20, buy. As I told you, I watched it a long time. For months, it sold between $1.10 and $1.20, getting nowhere in that particular. Well, sir, one day it closed at above $1.19. I got ready for it. Sure enough, the next day it opened at $1.20 and a half, and I bought. It went to $1.21, to $1.22, to $1.23, to $1.25, and I went with it. Now, I couldn't have told you at the time just what was going on. I didn't get any explanations about its behavior during the course of the limited fluctuations. I couldn't tell whether the breaking through the limit would be up through $1.20 or down through $1.10, though I suspected it would be up, because there was not enough wheat in the world for a big break in prices. As a matter of fact, it seems Europe had been buying quietly, and a lot of traders had gone short of it at around $1.19. Owing to the European purchases and other causes, a lot of wheat had been taken out of the market, so that finally the big movement got started. The price went beyond the $1.20 mark. That was all the point I had, and it was all I needed. I knew that when it crossed $1.20, it would be because the upward movement at last had gathered force to push it over the limit, and something had to happen. In other words, by crossing $1.20, the line of least resistance of wheat prices was established. It was a different story then. I remember that one day was a holiday with us, and all our markets were closed. Well, in Winnipeg, wheat opened up six cents a bushel. When our market opened on the following day, it also was up six cents a bushel. The price just went along the line of least resistance. What I've told you gives you the essence of my trading system as based on studying the tape. I merely learn the way prices are most probably going to move. I check out my own trading by additional tests to determine the psychological movement. I do that by watching the way the price acts after I begin. It is surprising how many experienced traders there are who look incredulous when I tell them that when I buy stocks for a rise, I like to pay top prices, and when I sell, I must sell low or not at all. 
It would not be so difficult to make money if a trader always stuck to his speculative guns, that is, waited for the line of least resistance to define itself, and begin buying only when the tape said up, or selling only when it said down. He should accumulate his line on the way up. Let him buy one-fifth of his full line. If that does not show him a profit, he must not increase his holdings, because he has obviously begun wrong. He is wrong temporarily, and there is no profit in being wrong at any time. The same tape that said up did not necessarily lie, merely because it is now saying not yet. In cotton, I was very successful in my trading for a long time. I had my theory about it, and I absolutely lived up to it. Suppose I had decided that my line would be forty to 50,000 bales. Well, I would study the tape as I told you, watching for an opportunity either to buy or to sell. Suppose the line of least resistance indicated a bull movement. Well, I would buy 10,000 bales. After I got through buying that, if the market went up 10 points over my initial purchase price, I would take on another 10,000 bales. Same thing. Then, if I could get 20 points profit or $1 a bale, I would buy 20,000 more. That would give me my line, my basis for my trading. But if, after buying the first 10 or 20,000 bales, it showed me a loss, out I go. I was wrong. It might be I was only temporarily wrong. But as I have said before, it doesn't pay to start wrong in anything. What I accomplished by sticking to my system was that I always had a line of cotton in every real movement. In the course of accumulating my full line, I might chip out fifty or $60,000 in these feeling out plays of mine. This looks like a very expensive testing, but it wasn't. After the real movement started, how long would it take me to make up the $50,000 I had dropped in order to make sure that I began to load up at exactly the right time? No time at all. It always pays a man to be right at the right time. As I think I also said before, this describes what I may call my system for placing my bets. It is simple arithmetic to prove that it is a wise thing to have the big bet down only when you win, and when you lose, to lose only a small exploratory bet, as it were. If a man trades in the way I have described, he will always be in the profitable position of being able to cash in on the big bet. Professional traders have always had some system or other based upon their experience and governed either by their attitude toward speculation or by their desires. I remember I met an old gentleman in Palm Beach whose name I did not catch or did not at once identify. I knew he had been in the street for years, way back in Civil War times. And somebody told me that he was a very wise old codger who had gone through so many booms and panics that he was always saying there was nothing new under the sun, and least of all in the stock market. The old fellow asked me a lot of questions. When I got through telling him about my usual practice and trading, he nodded and said, Yes, yes, you're right. The way you're built, the way your mind runs makes your system a good system for you. It comes easy for you to practice what you preach, because the money you bet is the least of your cares. I recollect Pat Hearn. Ever hear of him? Well, he was a very well-known sporting man, and he had an account with us. Clever chap, and nervy. He made money in stocks, and that made people ask him for advice. He would never give in. If they asked him point-blank for his opinion about the wisdom of their commitments, he used a favorite racetrack maxim of his. You can't tell till you bet. He traded in our office. He would buy 100 shares of some active stock, and when or if it went up 1%, he would buy another 100. On another point advance, another 100 shares, and so on. He used to say he wasn't playing the game to make money for others, and therefore he would put in a stop-loss order one point below the price of his last purchase. When the price kept going up, he simply moved up his stop with it. On a 1% reaction, he was stopped out. He declared he did not see any sense in losing more than one point whether it came out of his original margin or out of his paper profits. You know, a professional gambler is not looking for long shots, but for sure money. Of course, long shots are fine when they come in. In the stock market, Pat wasn't after tips or playing to catch 20 points a week advances. But sure money is sufficient quantity to provide him with a good living. Of all the thousands of outsiders that I have run across on Wall Street, Pat Hearn was the only one who saw in stock speculation merely a game of chance like faro or roulette, but nevertheless had the sense to stick to a relatively sound betting method. After Hearn's death, one of our customers, who had always traded with Pat and used his system, made over $100,000 in Lackawanna. Then he switched over to some other stock, and because he had made a big stake, he thought he need not stick to Pat's way. 
When a reaction came, instead of cutting short his losses, he let them run as though they were profits. Of course, every cent went. When he finally quit, he owed us several thousand dollars. He hung around for two or three years. He kept the fever long after the cash had gone, but we did not object as long as he behaved himself. I remember that he used to admit freely that he had been 10,000 kinds of an ass not to stick to Pat Hearn's style of play. Well, one day he came to me greatly excited and asked me to let him sell some stock short in our office. He was a nice enough chap who had been a good customer in his day, and I told him I personally would guarantee his account for 100 shares. He sold short 100 shares of Lakeshore. That was the time Bill Travers hammered the market in 1875. My friend Roberts put out that Lakeshore at exactly the right time and kept selling it on the way down, as he had done in the old successful days before he forsook Pat Hearn's system and instead listened to Hope's whispers. Well, sir, in four days of successful pyramiding, Roberts' account showed him a profit of $15,000. Observing that he had not put in a stop-loss order, I spoke to him about it, and he told me that the break hadn't fairly begun, and he wasn't going to be shaken out by any one-point reaction. This was in August. Before the middle of September, he borrowed $10 from me for a baby carriage, his fourth. He did not stick to his own proof system. That's the trouble with most of them. And the old fellow shook his head at me. And he was right. I sometimes think that speculation must be an unnatural sort of business. Because I find that the average speculator has arrayed himself his own nature. The weaknesses that all men are prone to are fatal to success in speculation. Usually those very weaknesses that make him likable to his fellows, or that he himself particularly guards against in those other ventures of his, where they are not nearly so dangerous as when he is trading in stocks and commodities. The speculator's chief enemies are always boring from within. It is inseparable from human nature to hope and to fear. In speculation, when the market goes against you, you hope that every day will be the last day, and you lose more than you should. Had you not listened to hope to the same ally that is so potent a successful bringer to empire builders and pioneers, big and little. And when the market goes your way, you become fearful that the next day will take away your profit, and you get out too soon. Fear keeps you from making as much money as you ought to. The successful trader has to fight these two deep-seated instincts. He has to reverse what you might call his natural impulses. Instead of hoping, he must fear. Instead of fearing, he must hope. He must fear that his loss may develop into a much bigger loss, and hope that his profit may become a big profit. It is absolutely wrong to gamble in stocks the way the average man does. I have been in speculative game ever since I was 14. It is all I have ever done. I think I know what I'm talking about, and the conclusion that I have reached after nearly 30 years of constant trading, both on a shoestring and with millions of dollars back of me, is this. A man may beat a stock or a group at a certain time, but no man living can beat the stock market. A man may make money out of individual deals in cotton or grain, but no man can beat the cotton market or the grain market. It's like the track. A man may beat a horse race, but he cannot beat horse racing. If I knew how to make these statements stronger or more emphatic, I certainly would. It does not make any difference what anybody says to the contrary. I know I am right in saying these incontrovertible statements. And now I'll get back to October 1907. I bought a yacht and made all preparations to leave New York for a cruise in southern waters. I am really daffy about fishing, and this was the time when I was going to fish to my heart's content, from my own yacht, going wherever I wished, whenever I felt like it. Everything was ready. I had made a killing in stocks, but at the last moment, corn held me back. I must explain that before the money panic, which gave me my first million, I had been trading in grain at Chicago. I was short 10 million bushels of wheat and 10 million bushels of corn. I had studied the grain markets for a long time and was as bearish on corn and wheat as I had been on stocks. Well, they both started down. But while wheat kept on de-dining, the biggest of all the Chicago operators, I'll call him Stratton, took it into his head to run a corner in corn. After I cleaned up in stocks and was ready to go south on my yacht, I found that wheat showed me a handsome profit, but in corn, Stratton had run up the price, and I had quite a loss. I knew there was much more corn in the country than the price indicated. The law of demand and supply worked as always, but the demand came chiefly from Stratton, and the supply was not coming at all. 
because there was an acute congestion in the movement of corn. I remember that I used to pray for a cold spell that would freeze the impassable roads and enable the farmers to bring their corn into the market, but no such luck. There I was, waiting to go on my joyously planned fishing trip and that loss in corn holding me back. I couldn't go away with the market as it was. Of course, Stratton kept pretty close tabs on the short interest. He knew he had me, and I knew it quite as well as he did. But as I said, I was hoping I might convince the weather that it ought to get busy and help me. Perceiving that neither the weather nor any other kindly wonder worker was paying any attention to my needs, I studied how I might work out of my difficulty by my own efforts. I closed out my line of wheat at a good profit, but the problem in corn was infinitely more difficult. If I could have covered my 10 million bushels at the prevailing prices, I instantly and gladly would have done so. Large, though, the loss would have been. But of course, the moment I started to buy in my corn, Stratton would be on the job as a squeezer-in-chief. And I no more relished running up the price on myself by reason of my own purchases than cutting my own throat with my own knife. Strong though corn was, my desire to go fishing was even stronger. So it was up to me to find a way out at once. I must conduct a strategic retreat. I must buy back the 10 million bushels I was short of, and in doing so, keep down my loss as much as I possibly could. It so happened that Stratton at that time was also running a deal in oats and had the market pretty well sewed up. I had kept track of all the grain markets in the way of crop news and pit gossip, and I heard that the powerful armor interests were not friendly market-wise to Stratton. Of course, I knew that Stratton would not let me have the corn I needed except at his own price. But the moment I heard the rumors about armor being against Stratton, it occurred to me that I might look to the Chicago traders for aid. The only way in which they could possibly help me was for them to sell me the corn that Stratton would. The rest was easy. First, I put in orders to buy 500,000 bushels of corn, every eighth of a cent down. After these orders were in, I gave to each of four houses an order to sell simultaneously 50,000 bushels of oats at the market. That, I figured, ought to make a quick break in oats. Knowing how the traders' minds worked, it was a cinch that they would instantly think that armor was gunning for Stratton. Seeing the attack opened in oats, they would logically conclude that the next break would be in corn, and they would start to sell it. If that corner in corn was busted, the pickings would be fabulous. My dope on the psychology of the Chicago traders was absolutely correct. When they saw oats breaking on the scattered selling, they promptly jumped on corn and sold it with great enthusiasm. I was able to buy 6 million bushels of corn in the next 10 minutes. The moment I found that their selling of corn ceased, I simply bought in the other 4 million bushels at the market. Of course, that made the price go up again, but the net result of my maneuver was that I covered the entire line of 10 million bushels within one half cent of the price prevailing at the time I started to cover on the trader's selling. The 200,000 bushels of oats that I sold short to start the trader's selling of corn, I covered at a loss of only $3,000. That was pretty cheap bear bait. The profits I had made in wheat offset so much of my deficit in corn that my total loss on all my grain trades that time was only $25,000. Afterwards, corn went up 25 cents a bushel. Stratton undoubtedly had me at his mercy. If I had set about buying my 10 million bushels of corn without bothering to think of the price, there's no telling what I would have had to pay. A man can't spend years at one thing and not acquire a habitual attitude towards it quite unlike that of the average beginner. The difference distinguishes the professional from the amateur. It is the way a man looks at things that makes or loses money for him in the speculative markets. The public has the dilettante's point of view toward his own effort. The ego obtrudes itself unduly, and the thinking, therefore, is not deep or exhaustive. The professional concerns himself with doing the right thing rather than with making money, knowing that the profit takes care of itself if the other things are attended to. A trader gets to play the game as the professional billiard player does. That is, he looks far ahead instead of considering the particular shot before him. It gets to be an instinct to play for position. I remember hearing a story about Addison Kamek that illustrates very nicely what I wish to point out. From all I have heard, I am inclined to think that Kamek was one of the ablest stock traders the street ever saw. He was not a chronic bear, as many believe, but he felt the greater appeal of trading on the bear side of utilizing in his behalf the two great human factors of hope and fear. He is credited with coining the warning, don't sell stocks when the sap is running up the trees, 
And the old-timers tell me that his biggest winnings were made on the bullseye. So that it is plain, he did not play prejudice, but condition. At all events, he was a consummate trader. It seems that once this was way back at the tag end of a bull market, Kamek was bearish. And J. Arthur Joseph, the financial writer and raconteur, knew it. The market, however, was not only strong but still rising, in response to prodding by the bull leaders and optimistic reports by the newspapers. Knowing what use a trader like Kamek could make of bearish information, Joseph rushed to Kamek's office one day with glad tidings. Mr. Kamek, I have a very good friend who is a transfer clerk in the St. Paul office, and he has just told me something which I think you ought to know. What is it? asked Kamek listlessly. You've turned, haven't you? You are bearish now, asked Joseph to make sure. If Kamek wasn't interested, he wasn't going to waste precious ammunition. Yes, what's the wonderful information? I went around to the St. Paul office today, as I do in my news gathering rounds two or three times a week. And my friend there said to me, the old man is selling stock. He met William Rockefeller. Is he really, Jimmy? I said to him. And he answered, yes. He is selling 1,500 shares every three-eighths of a point up. I've been transferring the stock for two or three days now. I didn't lose any time, but came right over to tell you. Kamek was not easily excited, and moreover, was so accustomed to having all manner of people rush madly into his office, with all manner of news, gossip, rumors, tips, and lies, that he had grown distrustful of them all. He merely said now, Are you sure you heard right, Joseph? Am I sure? Certainly I'm sure. Do you think I am deaf, said Joseph? Are you sure of your man? Absolutely, declared Joseph. I've known him for years. He has never lied to me. He wouldn't. No object. I know he is absolutely reliable, and I'd stake my life on what he tells me. I know him as well as I know anybody in this world, a great deal better than you seem to know me after all these years. Sure of him, eh? And Kamek again looked at Joseph. Then he said, well, you ought to know. He called his broker, W.B. Wheeler. Joseph expected to hear him give an order to sell at least 50,000 shares of St. Paul. William Rockefeller was disposing of his holdings in St. Paul, taking advantage of the strength of the market. Whether it was investment stock or speculative holdings was irrelevant. The one important fact was that the best stock trader of the standard oil crowd was getting out of St. Paul. What would the average man have done if he had received the news from a trustworthy source? No need to ask. But Kamek, the ablest bear operator of his day, who was bearish on the market, just then said to his broker, Billy, go over to the board and buy 1,500 St. Paul every three-eighths up. The stock was then in the 90s. Don't you mean sell, interjected Joseph hastily? He was no novice in Wall Street, but he was thinking of the market from the point of view of the newspaper man, and incidentally, of the general public. The price certainly ought to go down on the news of inside selling. And there was no better inside selling than Mr. William Rockefeller's. The standard oil getting out and Kamek buying. It couldn't be. No, said Kamek. I mean buy. Don't you believe me? Yes. Don't you believe my information? Yes. Aren't you bearish? Yes. Well then, that's why I'm buying. Listen to me now. You keep in touch with that reliable friend of yours, and the moment the scaled selling stops, let me know instantly. Do you understand? Yes, said Joseph, and went away, not quite sure he could fathom Kamek's motives in buying William Rockefeller's stock. It was the knowledge that Kamek was bearish on the entire market that made his maneuver so difficult to explain. However, Joseph saw his friend the transfer clerk and told him he wanted to be tipped off when the old man got through selling. Regularly, twice a day, Joseph called on his friend to inquire. One day, the transfer clerk told him, There isn't any more stock coming from the old man. Joseph thanked him and ran to Kamek's office with the information. Kamek listened attentively, turned to Wheeler and asked, Billy, how much St. Paul have we got in the office? Wheeler looked it up and reported that they had accumulated about 60,000 shares. Kamek, being bearish, had been putting out short lines in the other Grangers, as well as in various other stocks, even before he began to buy St. Paul. He was now heavily short of the market. He promptly ordered Wheeler to sell the 60,000 shares of St. Paul that they were long off, and more besides. He used his long holdings of St. Paul as a lever to depress the general list and greatly benefit his operations for a decline. St. Paul didn't stop on that move until it reached 44, and Kamek made a killing in it. He played his cards with consummate skill and profited accordingly. The point I would make is his habitual attitude toward trading. He didn't have to reflect. He saw instantly what was far more important to him than his profit on that one stock. 
He saw that he had providentially been offered an opportunity to begin his Big Bear operations, not only at the proper time, but with the proper initial push. The St. Paul tip made him buy instead of sell because he saw at once that it gave him a vast supply of the best ammunition for his bear campaign. To get back to myself, after I closed my trade in weed and corn, I went south in my yacht. I cruised about in Florida waters, having a grand old time. The fishing was great. Everything was lovely. I didn't have a care in the world, and I wasn't looking for any. One day, I went ashore at Palm Beach. I met a lot of Wall Street friends and others. They were all talking about the most picturesque cotton speculator of the day. A report from New York had it that Percy Thomas had lost every cent. It wasn't a commercial bankruptcy, merely the rumor of the world-famous operator's second Waterloo in the cotton market. I'd always felt a great admiration for him. The first I ever heard of him was through the newspapers at the time of the failure of the stock exchange house of Sheldon and Thomas, when Thomas tried to corner cotton. Sheldon, who did not have the vision or the courage of his partner, got cold feet on the very verge of success. At least, so the street said at the time. At all events, instead of making a killing, they made one of the most sensational failures in years. I forget how many millions. The firm was wound up, and Thomas went to work alone. He devoted himself exclusively to cotton, and it was not long before he was on his feet again. He paid off his creditors in full with interest debts he was not legally obliged to discharge, and withal had a million dollars left for himself. His comeback in the cotton market was in its way as remarkable as Deacon S.B. White's famous stock market exploit of paying off one million dollars in one year. Thomas's luck and brains made me admire him immensely. Everybody in Palm Beach was talking about the collapse of Thomas's deal in March Cotton. You know how the talk goes and grows, the amount of misinformation and exaggeration and improvements that you hear? Why, I've seen a rumor about myself grow so that the fellow who started it did not recognize it when it came back to him in less than 24 hours, swollen with new and picturesque details. The news of Percy Thomas's latest misadventure turned my mind from the fishing to the cotton market. I got files of the trade papers and read them to get a line on conditions. When I got back to New York, I gave myself up to studying the market. Everybody was bearish and everybody was selling July cotton. You know how people are. I suppose it's the contagion of example that makes a man do something because everybody around him is doing the same thing. Perhaps it is some phase or variety of the herd instinct. In any case, it was, in the opinion of hundreds of traders, the wise and proper thing to sell July cotton and so safe too. You couldn't call that general selling reckless. The word is too conservative. The traders simply saw one side to the market and a great big profit. They certainly expected a collapse in prices. I saw all this, of course, and it struck me that the chaps who were short didn't have a terrible lot of time to cover it. The more I studied the situation, the clearer I saw this, until I finally decided to buy July cotton. I went to work and quickly bought 100,000 bales. I experienced no trouble in getting it because it came from so many sellers. It seemed to me that I could have offered a reward of $1 million for the capture, dead or alive, of a single trader who was not selling July cotton, and nobody would have claimed it. I should say this was the latter part of May. I kept buying more, and they kept on selling it to me, until I had picked up all the floating contracts, and I had 120,000 bales. A couple of days after I bought the last of it, it began to go up. Once it started, the market was kind enough to keep on doing very well indeed. That is... It went up from 40 to 50 points a day. One Saturday, this was about 10 days after I began operations, the price began to creep up. I did not know whether there was any more July cotton for sale. It was up to me to find out. So I waited until the last 10 minutes. At that time, I knew it was usual for those fellows to be short. And if the market closed up for the day, they would be safely hooked. So I sent in four different orders to buy 5,000 bales each at the market at the same time. That ran the price up 30 points, and the shorts were doing their best to wriggle away. The market closed at the top. All I did, remember, was to buy that last 20,000 bales. The next day was Sunday, but on Monday, Liverpool was due to open up 20 points to be on a parity with the advance in New York. Instead, it came 50 points higher. That meant that Liverpool had exceeded our advance by 100%. I had nothing to do with the rise in that market. This showed me that my deductions had been sound and that I was trading along the line of least resistance. At the same time, I was not losing sight of the fact that I had a whopping big line to dispose of. A market may advance sharply or rise gradually, 
and yet not possess the power to absorb more than a certain amount of selling. Of course, the Liverpool cables made our own market wild, but I noticed the higher it went, the scarcer July cotton seemed to be. I wasn't letting go any of mine. Altogether, that Monday was an exciting and not very cheerful day for the bears. But for all that, I could detect no signs of an impending bear panic. No beginnings of a blind stampede to cover. And I had 140,000 bales, for which I must find a market. On Tuesday morning, as I was walking to my office, I met a friend at the entrance of the building. That was quite a story in the world this morning, he said with a smile. What story, I asked. What, do you mean to tell me you haven't seen it? I never see the world, I said. What's the story? Why, it's all about you. It says you've got July Cotton Corner. I haven't seen it, I told him and left him. I don't know whether he believed me or not, and he probably thought it was highly inconsiderate of me not to tell him whether it was true or not. When I got to the office, I sent out for a copy of the paper. Sure enough, there it was on the front page in big headlines. July Cotton Cornered by Larry Livingston. Of course, I knew at once that the article would play the dickens with the market. If I had deliberately studied ways and means of disposing of my 140,000 bales to the best advantage, I couldn't have hit upon a better plan. It would not have been possible to find one. That article, at the very moment, was being read all over the country, either in the world or in other papers quoting it. It had been cabled to Europe. That was plain from the Liverpool prices. That market was simply wild. No wonder with such news. Of course, I knew what New York would do and what I ought to do. The market here opened at 10 o'clock. At 10 minutes after 10, I did not own any cotton. I let them have every one of my 140,000 bales. For most of my line, I received what proved to be the top prices of the day. The traders made the market for me. All I really did was to see a heaven-sent opportunity to get rid of my cotton. I grasped it because I couldn't help it. What else could I do? The problem that I knew would take a great deal of hard thinking to solve was thus solved for me by an accident. If the world had not published that article, I never would have been able to dispose of my line without sacrificing the greater portion of my paper profits. Selling 140,000 bales of July cotton without sending the price down was a trick beyond my powers. But the world story turned it for me very nicely. Why the world published it, I cannot tell you. I never knew. I suppose the writer was tipped off by some friends in the cotton market, and he thought he was printing a scoop. I didn't see him or anybody from the world. I didn't know it was printed that morning until after 9 o'clock. And if it had not have been for my friend calling my attention to it, I would not have known it then. Without it, I wouldn't have had a market big enough to unload in. That is one trouble about trading on a large scale. You cannot sneak out as you can when you pike along. You cannot always sell out when you wish or when you think it wise. You have to get out when you can, when you have a market that will absorb your entire line. Failure to grasp the opportunity to get out may cost you millions. You cannot hesitate. If you do, you are lost. Neither can you try stunts like running up the price on the bears by means of competitive buying, for you may thereby reduce the absorbing capacity. And I want to tell you that perceiving your opportunity is not as easy as it sounds. A man must be on the lookout so alertly that when his chance sticks in its head at his door, he must grab it. Of course, not everybody knew about my fortunate accident. In Wall Street, and, for that matter, everywhere else, any accident that makes big money for a man is regarded with suspicion. When the accident is unprofitable, it is never considered an accident, but the logical outcome of your hoggishness, or of the swelled head. But when there is a profit, they call it loot, and talk about how well unscrupulousness fares and how ill conservatism and decency. It was not only the evil-minded shorts smarting under punishment brought about by their own recklessness who accused me of having deliberately planned the cope. Other people thought the same thing. One of the biggest men in cotton in the entire world met me a day or two later and said, That was certainly the slickest deal you ever put over, Livingston. I was wondering how much you were going to lose when you came to market that line of yours. You knew this market was not big enough to take more than 50 or 60,000 bales without selling off. And how you were going to work off the rest and not lose all your paper profits was beginning to interest me. I didn't think of your scheme. It certainly was slick. I had nothing to do with it, I assured him as earnestly as I could. But all he did was to repeat, Mighty slick, my boy. Mighty slick. Don't be so modest. It was after that deal that some of the papers referred to me as the Cotton King. But as I said... 
I really was not entitled to that crown. It is not necessary to tell you that there is not enough money in the United States to buy the columns of the New York world, or enough personal pool to secure the publication of a story like that. It gave me an utterly unearned reputation that time. But I have not told this story to moralize on the crowns that are sometimes pressed down upon the brows of undeserving traitors, or to emphasize the need of seizing the opportunity, no matter when or how it comes. My object merely was to account for the vast amount of newspaper notoriety that came to me as the result of my deal in July Cotton. If it hadn't been for the newspapers, I never would have met that remarkable man, Percy Thomas.